It's safe to say that humanity has come a very long way in terms of intelligence and technological progress since the days of the Pleistocene. Just one walk through your local town will be enough to prove that change. Caves, plains, and forests have been exchanged for houses and flats, with cars along every street. The mobile phones in our pockets and computers in our homes have almost rewired our brains to rely upon modern technology, giving the illusion that we have abandoned our ancestral roots and ways of thinking. This, however, could not be further from the truth. You may not recognize it all the time, but the emotions you feel, quirks you exhibit, and behaviors you show are all derived from the times humans were living in caves and hunting megafauna on the Great Steppes. In today's video, we will be examining the evolution of the human brain, focusing in particular on the habits and curiosities that have been retained in our inherited caveman brains. The niche study of early human mindsets and brains is known as evolutionary psychology and focuses not just on modern developments in thinking, but developments over millions upon millions of years. Today's video will see us spanning not only generations, but entire species of humans and primates to examine just what makes our brains similar to those of our ancestors. Sit back and relax as we travel back in time to examine the true nature of our caveman brains. Before we examine what connects our modern ways of thinking to those of cavemen, we first need to understand why we have evolved to become so intelligent. At its core, our brain structure is very similar to the brain structure seen in every mammal species. A complex limbic system of internal structures that provide us with our feelings, emotions, thoughts, and memories surrounded by a cerebral cortex that helps us with our main senses as well as speech and forward planning. Now, obviously, we don't see the average mammals, such as rats, dogs, and cats, exhibiting the same complex social behavior and technological developments as human beings. But why is that? In short, we don't know for sure, but there are several theories as to why it was the primates that developed these capabilities, and not another group of animals. One important thing to note is that humans in the Pleistocene, on the grand scale, were not massively more mentally advanced than the animals they shared the plains and forests with. The humans hunting on the plains of Africa millions of years ago, for example, could not all of a sudden start naturally crafting tools and building houses. These were behaviors and knowledge that needed to be accumulated over the course of many generations. Humans initially evolved to have big brains because it would be advantageous to them in a world where they were not the top predators. The humans that were more intelligent were more likely to survive than those who were not, and thus the surviving humans were the individuals who were responsible for crafting the first simple stone tools. This knowledge was shared with family members, from tribe to tribe, and then eventually when civilization came to humanity, through trade. It was far from an overnight process and certain technologies were obtained over the course of millions of years. One could argue that we have not in fact become much more intelligent since the Pleistocene, but have just managed to accumulate more of this knowledge in order to craft more advanced tools and harness more difficult technologies, of which the prerequisites were obtained over time. Humans are also thought to have become more intelligent as a result of conspecific competition, or competition within members of their own species. Early humans lived in small family groups or tribes, and would eventually settle down into agricultural or pastoralist communities in a similar manner. The groups that were naturally more intelligent had access to better technologies and tools, and in the end were able to survive and overcome competition from the same species. Because humans were only competing amongst their own species in this manner, 
and not with other animals. This allowed them to become more technologically advanced than, say, mammoths or saber-toothed cats. There is also an argument that focuses on the way humans specifically began to cook and eat their food. As humans learned to cook their food to make it more palatable and rid it of parasites and harmful bacteria, we became able to eat more of it, in turn providing us with useful energy that could be used for other things. Some of this energy is thought to have increased the size of our brain's frontal lobe, the part of the brain responsible for the way we think and how we remember things. This, in turn, would have allowed these groups of humans to become more and more intelligent over time. Evolution takes an incredibly long time. A species may not change much at all visually over the space of a few million years, but change is taking place. In some circumstances, the changes are more closely visible internally, and this is the case with human beings. The changes that have taken place regarding the way we handle tools and manipulate our environment are relatively new developments in the grand scheme of things and have been drastic changes to say the least. It should come as no surprise then that we have not yet fully rid our systems of some of the ways the cavemen were hardwired to think and act. In this section we will discuss these ways of thinking examining what makes you similar to your cave-dwelling ancestors. Think for a moment about what life was like for an early human trying to survive in the cold plains and forests of the Pleistocene. Put yourself in their shoes. You would not yet have been an apex predator. You may have had no reliable way of illuminating the dark nights and caves, and you needed to constantly rely on your hunting capabilities in order to simply feed yourself for the day. There's no doubt that a high degree of stress must have plagued these early people, and they needed to be in a constant state of action, ready to defend themselves or run with a moment's notice, should a hungry cave lion or bear emerge from the shadows. You might be familiar with this process already in your own life. It is colloquially known as the fight-or-flight response. When a caveman was presented with a threat, they would need to be able to react fast to ensure the best possible outcome for themselves. They had no control over this. It was an innate feature that their brains were hardwired to help with. In such a situation, cortisol, epinephrine, and norepinephrine chemicals ignite the human sympathetic nervous system. This is why when stressed or scared, you will experience faster breathing and a reduced appetite, perhaps accompanied by less obvious changes such as dilated pupils, the ability to move your muscles quicker and faster, and constricted blood vessels. It is this response that would force the caveman to make a vital decision helping them to save their life. Would they stand their ground and fight, or flee in the opposite direction? It is likely that you yourself are familiar with the fight or flight response. If you've ever been in a situation where you may have been harmed, or if you've ever felt significant stress in your day-to-day -day life, it might be that the remnants of the caveman's fight or flight system have taken over and forced you to make a decision on the spot. In the relatively safe worlds we have created for ourselves in the modern day, it is significantly less common to encounter the fight-or-flight response, but it is there. It would seem many of the reproductive habits exhibited by human beings can be traced back to the cavemen of the Pleistocene too. Outside of cultural impact, natural history has a big part to play in how our brains are hardwired to find somebody attractive and how we act around our partners. These cavemen quirks are perhaps the most apparent when scientists undertook a study of couples in a bar. Scientists studying the behaviors of these couples noticed distinct involuntary habits shown by both men and women when spending times with their significant others. Men would habitually hold their chests forward and make the first physical contact with their partner whereas women would twirl their hair with their hands when they seemed to be connecting with the opposite sex. 
These are thought to have been natural, involuntary behavioral quirks that were shown by cavemen and women when getting to know one another with the intention of mating. Other activities present in our life that make us happy are naturally hardwired to do so within our brains and bodies, originating from those early days of human evolution in the Pleistocene plains and forests. Take, for example, when you eat a meal you particularly enjoy. Our cavemen brains have evolved to find particular foods tasty, so we specifically want to eat them, which will serve as fuel for our bodies, and therefore energy that will make us want to survive, and in the long run, thrive. You may also notice that you feel particularly good after exercising, or partaking in a hobby you enjoy. This reward system is what makes us human and we are hardwired to enjoy certain things for our own good. All of this being said, it is important to remember that the brains of cavemen did not evolve to suit the lavish, supply and demand lifestyles that many human beings have grown to depend upon in modern times. Many aspects of our caveman brains evolved to help us keep safe and to further the advancement of the human race. Sometimes they struggle to keep up with the world around us today, and this can lead to the development of bad habits and even addictions in some people. In cavemen, the reward system within their brains developed to make them want to get up and chase prey, to make them want to reproduce, and to help them further their communities and families. Now that all of this is essentially done for us by the vast societies we live in, we have a tendency to exploit or neglect our bodies by giving in to the reward systems in our caveman brains. Dopamine hits that are provided when somebody drinks alcohol or smokes a cigarette after a stressful day can quickly lead to bad habits if left unchecked. Our bodies, craving more dopamine, are more likely to repeat bad habits, which can lead to nasty addictions and long-term consequences for our lives. Cavemen were obviously living in a world long before such shocks to our systems as drugs, alcohol, gambling, unhealthy processed foods, and cigarettes, and so we often find it very hard to break this cycle once an addiction takes hold. It's almost as though you're fighting against the very nature of being a human being. Our caveman brains think they're helping us by taking part in destructive behaviors, and as a result, some people's lives are transformed for the worse. In these circumstances, it becomes useful for humans to override their caveman brains by undertaking different behaviors and actions, and perhaps seeking professional help if the problem is particularly difficult to overcome. It's a staggering thought that deep within our minds, the primal traits and behaviors of our long-lost ancestors still impact the way we think, talk, and act. Even when our societies have become so vastly different, our connection to evolution in the natural world is still very apparent. But as we've learned, that's not always the best thing. The next time you have a bad day, feel frightened, or experience something stressful, perhaps understanding why you feel this way could be key to your perseverance and ultimate survival. You're feeling adapted versions of the emotions experienced by your very earliest human ancestors.